welcome everybody uh, to the Semft family lecture. Um, and this is on the impact of successful uh, family businesses on communities. And uh, my name is Professor Bruce Curran. And so I will be handling the kind of introductory portion of the, uh, of the talk. Um, and uh, then shortly I will call on uh, Rod Seft to uh, basically give, say some words of his own and to introduce um, uh, Harvey, our esteemed Harvey Sector, our esteemed uh, lecturer today. Uh, Harvey will be speaking on and, you know, the fact that successful family businesses build strong economies and healthy communities and talking about the advisor's role in perpetuating the virtuous circle. Um, and uh, at the end, after his talk, uh, there will be a uh, question and answer session. So more on that in a minute. And then uh, we will call on Professor McPherson to say some kind of thank yous and acknowledgements for the people who have had a good hand in uh, bringing this lecture to you, uh, because obviously there was quite a bit of um, organizational and administrative details to look after. But before we get going, we'd like to start with a territorial acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So now just for the housekeeping items, what I would ask that you do is please uh, mute your mics. Uh, also a friendly reminder that this is being recorded and we will be posting the recording on the Robson Hall YouTube channel. And what I would um, ask that you do is if you are at all concerned about appearing on camera, you can consider simply muting the video on your screen. As I indicated previously, there will be a question and answer session at the end, and I will help to moderate that. In order to uh, ask questions, you have a couple of uh, different channels. One is to simply raise your hand either digitally or manually, and the other is to send to the kind of host and co-host through the chat feature your questions, and we will, we will uh, attempt to answer the questions in the order that is received, and I will try to help to, to, moderate, uh, to moderate that. So uh, next, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the, introduce the SEMFs. And so the SEMF lecture is named in honor of University of Manitoba alumna Rod and Jeannie Semft, who have given a very generous gift to the Faculty of Law and the Asper School of Business. And this gift is meant to support work regarding family business and the law. Family business is a discrete area of economic activity that is important to study and disseminate knowledge about given its pervasive influence in our society. We are honored to have Rod and Jeannie with us today and I would like to introduce you uh, to them. They have a successful family business related to Rod's business at Tricor Pacific Rod has a BCom degree and a law degree, both from the University of Manitoba. Rod practiced for many years here in Winnipeg, uh, including at TDS. I know there's a number of lawyers from TDS on our call, and then became general con counsel at Cargill Grain. In 1996, he went into private business, primarily equity investing, and Tricor Pacific manages private capital in excess of $1 billion at the mid-market level across North America. Rod continues to have a connection to the original fund. Additionally, 
there is a SEMF family office that invests in that invests in public and privately held equity investments across a portfolio of sectors, including proteins, trucking, and real estate. And many talented members of the SEMF family work there. And Rod and Jeannie have shared their wealth through the SEMF family foundation. The SEMF family business shares a family, should rather, shares its success through various philanthropic activities. And I would now like to invite Rod to say a few words, both about the lecture series and about Harvey Sector. So Rod, uh, please take it away and thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm so glad to be here and welcome to everybody who's on the call. Um, Jeannie and I uh, have been involved in our own family business. And it's always interesting to think about the fact that you can look at statistics and see that family businesses are the predominant uh, structure in almost every economy. And uh, Winnipeg is no exception. Canada is no exception. You can, in, in where we live in Vancouver, you don't have to look farther than companies like Aritzia or Lululemon uh, in Vancouver. You can think about uh, every major real estate developer is, is virtually a family business. You can walk down the street in Winnipeg, you can watch a bison transport truck roll by. Uh, and most importantly, and how topical it is today, you can think about a company that you don't even think about as being a family business, your, your communications provider, a Rogers Communications. Okay. And suddenly you find, well, they're a family business and boy, are they ever. And what they, um, and what they highlight is that in addition to the commercial side of the business, there's the family side of the business and it's important. And I know in our business, we've taken it from uh, a relatively small uh, you know, concept when we started with a couple of A&W restaurants to today we, we span across a number of, uh, of, of major industry sectors in Canada and the United States. And we're able to do that with the help of our advisors. Our advisors are of critical importance to us. And when we thought in fact, I would say that um, our legal advisors and our uh, accounting advisors, our tax advisors, these advisors are what enable us to uh, achieve the successes that we've achieved. And hopefully, in every country, there is an expression, church sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, clogs to clogs in three generations, rice patties to rice patties in three generations. And you may be seeing that playing out in the rot. Well, Roger's got a really big rice patty. So they might, uh, they might be able to make it through four or five generations. But we're trying to dodge that bullet with the help of our advisors. And uh, when we thought about Winnipeg and how we could do something uh, for our alma mater, which, which we love and, uh, and have just had, I, we, I had way too much fun there, frankly. Um, when we try to think about how we could get back, we wanted to really do something where we thought we could add value. And in Winnipeg, the family business does form the backbone of, uh, you know, of so much of Winnipeg's uh, industry and commerce. Now, when I went to the University of uh, Manitoba, in a long time ago in commerce. Imagine there was a student, uh, a student in my class named Harvey Sector. And uh, that's how far back we go. And imagine my shock. Um, I go through a commerce with Harvey who turns out to be, he's a pretty good student. And uh, he, he leaves commerce and uh, goes into his family business and takes a retail a chain of, uh, of how I thought of them as fashion stores and creates from 10 stores to a chain of 150 stores. Retailing's tough, it's competitive. Uh, obviously Harvey's got something. To be able to build a family business like that is pretty exceptional. And then um, I watch his career because he's a classmate of mine and I know him, he's a good guy. And he'll look out and next thing you know, he's going to Harvard. And that's impressive. He goes to law school there. Um, he was uh, an exceptional student. Um, and he became an exceptional chancellor after his law degree of the university. Um, he's an exceptional individual. 
But imagine today how fortunate we are to have him speaking to us because he not only built his own business, he not only has the incredible uh, academic credentials to be a great advisor, but one of the things that I've observed is he's an, an incredibly respected advisor at one of the most important businesses. I don't know whether he's allowed to even talk about it in the very private company of the Richardson family. And uh, if you drive across the prairies and you see uh, all of the grain facilities, if you walk down the street, as I said, and watch a bison transport roll by, or if you walk across Porter and Portage of Maine and see their real estate holdings, you realize that to be asked onto the board of Richardson's and to be an advisor, you're, in a, you're a very special uh, and intelligent individual who we are so fortunate to have speak to us today on a topic that is extremely uh, germane. It's, uh, it's near and dear to my heart because we use uh, lawyers, we use accountants extensively. We know how important they are. We know how important our advisors are. So Harvey, uh, I'm waiting with bated breath as is Jeannie uh, to hear you talk about this interesting topic today. The platform is yours. Thank you, Rod. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I'm glad that uh, none of my children have uh, access to a mic because they would probably want to refute a lot of what you said. <laughs> uh, but, but notwithstanding that, uh, I, I think uh, today for me is, is, is particularly uh, significant for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is, is being invited to, uh, to give the Seth family lecture uh, because when I became dean uh, just before the turn of the century, uh, one of the priorities that we set was, was trying to build uh, on this notion of the law school having a focus on family business. Uh, and over the years, we've had several people uh, that have been instrumental in helping us uh, develop that program. Uh, we have the Bayes Hotel Center that uh, you know, many of you have heard of, uh, and we have the Asper uh, Chair in International Business Law, and we now have the Sam Family Lecture Series. Uh, what's significant in my mind about those three things is, is the nature of the donors. Uh, all of the donors that made those things possible, uh, being uh, Izzy Asper, Marcel Des Hotel, and, and the Sam family, uh, were graduates of law. Uh, all of them uh, are people who went into business, uh, all of whom had tremendous success. Uh, but more importantly, all of them combined that success with a deep commitment to community uh, and, and really represent uh, what. I'd like to share with you today, which is my belief that, that uh, the nature of life in Canada and, and as Rod referred to quite, quite extensively around the world is inextricably intertwined with people who've been successful in, in their business ventures, uh, but who as part of that have maintained a deep commitment to community. So one of the things that we wanna talk about today is what's the nature of that, uh, how it, uh, how it works, uh, when it works, uh, and as Rod referred to, it doesn't always work, uh, and the role of advisors uh, in helping make that work and continue that uh, into the future. Uh, so uh, first of all, to, to Rod and Jeannie, uh, who have their own family business, who have history with uh, other family businesses in their own families and elsewhere, uh, thank you for your commitment to uh, your alma mater. Uh, and uh, it's been a delight reconnecting with you through the uh, front and center campaign uh, through this and uh, God willing, we look forward to uh, future opportunities to do that uh, together again. In, in terms of uh, picking up on, on Rod's very generous introduction though, I, I, I would just like to make sure that uh, I share with you uh, some of my experience and, and, and history and why I have such an interest in this notion of intergenerational transitions in family businesses. Uh, as Rod said, uh, I was a member of a family business uh, back in the 60s through till the late 1980s. Uh, when we sold and I left our family business uh, and went to law school, 
Uh, as a result of that, I, I ended up uh, at Harvard and, and one of the projects that we had to complete as, as, as part of the master's program there uh, was doing a, a major research paper. Uh, and I chose to do mine on the basis of uh, principles of dispute resolution, how they might be applied uh, to help family businesses uh, more successfully transition from one generation to another. Uh, since leaving uh, the law school, I pursued a, a practice uh, that I started while I was still there uh, in the dispute resolution. Uh, and a certain amount of the work I do, uh, it really comes about uh, when transitions don't work successfully or don't work well. Uh, and that generates an awful lot of business for people doing mediation and arbitration work. Uh, it's always fascinating to me how much more people are willing to spend to solve a problem uh, than they are to try and prevent it from occurring. Uh, as Rod mentioned, I also sit on the board of uh, a couple of companies, uh, one of which is a very large family business, uh, who seems to be doing a, a very successful job uh, of uh, avoiding, avoiding uh, the shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve in three generations that Rod referred to. My first real exposure and intrigue in, in this whole question uh, it goes back to the 1970s when I was still in business and attended a lecture uh, at a YPO conference. Uh, and there was a professor there who was talking uh, about uh, decision making, successful decision making, and the consequences of it not being. And he introduced a word that I've never forgotten and, and uh, has stayed with me throughout the years called opera threats. The professor's name was Itzaka Dizas, uh, and he had a thesis that he developed that suggested that what people saw as either terrible, you know, unfortunate circumstances or great opportunities really had less to do in most cases with the incident itself than it did with how that business, that organization, that person addressed them. And since what was seen as either a great opportunity or something that was very dangerous had more to do with how they were handled. He developed this, this term called opera threat. Uh, the time I was there, uh, our business had transitioned already from the first generation, because it was started by my late father, uh, and uh, was now controlled by the second generation in our family. Uh, it was a period of time in the 70s when uh, retail business was booming across the prairies. Uh, so our business was quite good, but notwithstanding that, the seeds for the eventual separation of our family from the business uh, were already planted, although not yet seen. Uh, they hadn't spread it from the ground yet. But aside from my personal uh, interest in, in family history, uh, I think it's important to, to put this in perspective on a national, international basis. In 2019, the Financial Post had a headline article and it was titled, Family Businesses Own a Bigger Chunk of Canada's Economy Than You Think. Way bigger. That was the title. The article suggested uh, that family businesses are directly responsible for approximately one half of the private sector contribution to Canada's GDP and roughly half of employment uh, in the private sector. Translate that to, to absolute numbers, that represented at the time close to $600 billion in value added and accounted for approximately 7 million jobs for Canadians. As Rob referred to in his introduction, family businesses come in all sizes from small startups uh, through farming and fishing to the local merchant to mega corporations, both public and private. What's important to remember is while not all private companies, become very large. I've never yet heard of a very large corporation that didn't begin as a small one. Small corporations have generally been defined as those having fewer than 100 employees uh, and less than $50 million in revenues. They represent 95% of all Canadian businesses. In terms of that $600 billion in value added that uh, the Financial Post was referring to, private companies 
generally smaller ones, represent approximately two thirds of that $600 billion. In comparison, the very large companies represent only two tenths of 1% of all the incorporated entities in Canada. Notwithstanding that, that there's very few of them, uh, they're very large in terms of the impact they have and they represent about a third of, of all of that uh, value added I referred to. Although we often think of family businesses as being privately owned, uh, as Rod mentioned in his introduction, uh, many are not. And fully, uh, according to studies done in the States, one third of the S&P of 500 companies are controlled by families. Similarly, in, in Canada, a lot of public companies uh, have family control or, or family influence. It's not just even a North American phenomenon. 40% of the largest firms in Germany and France and 60% of the largest firms in Asia and Latin America are family controlled. So it's not a stretch to say that really family businesses are the linchpin of the economic power in this country. There's been a variety of, of, of ways of defining what's a family business and, and it varies within the context of, of, like you said earlier, whether it's private or public. Uh, but basically, I, my sense is that any business that has more than one family member involved in its ownership and management falls under the category of the general definition of a family business. They're everywhere. I live in River Heights, a neighborhood filled with local family businesses as well as national chains. I shop for groceries at a store called G.J. Andrews. I shop at Denardi's, uh, as well as at Sobeys. When I need something around the house, I go to either Cordon Hardware, Canadian Tire, or Walmart. All of those are businesses that are either family owned or family controlled. Uh, the same is true uh, when I'm at home using the internet, which I get from Shaw, or out and about uh, using my cell phone, which is with Rogers. If you buy a car in Manitoba, the likelihood is you're buying it from a dealer that's owned by one of three family-owned enterprises. If you're a sports fan and you enjoy hockey, you probably already know that the Winnipeg Jets are owned by a partnership of two family businesses. They play in an arena named the Canada Life Arena because of the sponsorship of Canada Life a company controlled by Power Corporation, which in turn is another family controlled public company. In Manitoba, family companies, particularly the privately owned ones are very significant. Rod referred to the Richardson family. There's also Price Industries, the various companies owned by the Chipman family, the Pollards, Palliser Furniture. As well, we have outside of the city, an awful large number of critically important family controlled, family owned businesses, whether it be low on windows, freeze and printers, Golden West communications, and the myriad of family, rural families uh, that have family far farms, which these days have become major, major businesses. What's intriguing to me is not only the breadth of their influence, but the fact that most studies have shown that family controlled public companies consistently outperform their pre peer group in virtually every study that's been done anywhere in the world. So although we have this great deal of success in these family businesses, we often only hear and, and news covers uh, the families that look like they're auditioning for a new Netflix series uh, more than just running a successful business. And we've seen those splits between the McCain family, uh, the current one between uh, amongst members of the Rogers family, uh, a few years ago, the Stradic family uh, between father and daughter over control of uh, Magna. Family businesses though, really are critically important to the success of the economy, but as well, they play a critical role in my mind in contributing to the quality of life that we have and maintaining a civil society. 
although I think that's always been true and uh, philanthropy and community building has its roots in biblical times, uh, it's only recently uh, that uh, authors and, and, and students of, of family businesses uh, have started to really explore those links uh, in a more thoughtful way. Forbes did a, an interesting study or published an interesting study that was uh, really done by McKinsey, Boston Consulting and Credit Suisse uh, that studied family businesses uh, that had a billion dollars in revenue or in assets rather, uh, and at least had gone through uh, one succession event. It included such companies as Estee Lauder, Hallmark Cards, Walmart, Cargill, and L.L. Bean. And it identified what they called the five C's of success. And I think those are some of those C's are critical elements in what I see as the link between family businesses and community. Three of them in particular stand out. They talked about the importance in family businesses of continuity, of taking the long view uh, about all their decision making. It talked about connections, uh, the importance that family owned or family controlled businesses place on fostering relationships both within the company and between their company, uh, its suppliers, its customers, and its employees. And the third one was what they refer to as community, that family businesses historically and continue to this day to play, place a significant emphasis on being part of the community in which they and their employees live and work uh, and wanting to contribute to their well being. Fortunately, for, for those in, of us who live in Winnipeg, uh, we've been beneficiaries of that many of our uh, former. Winnipeggers have maintained that sense of community uh, and people like the Semps uh, are perfect examples of that. We saw that throughout the front and center campaign. So we have this, this, this sense that people involved in businesses, when they're family controlled, attach some of those fundamental values, uh, not just within their own sphere, but, but extend it through to the community in which they live and work. We were chatting before the uh, broadcast began uh, ab about changes that are occurring in Winnipeg. You may recall about 10 years ago, the Globe and Mail wrote an article uh, that talked about Winnipeg's, what they refer to as Winnipeg's Renaissance. And its headline was often, often overlooked Winnipeg is experiencing a quiet Renaissance, reinventing itself at every level and embracing its past in an effort to shore up its future. I remember when the article first came out, it was met with some degree of skepticism. Not so anymore. Recently, Winnipeg was included in Time Magazine's list of the world's greatest places of 2021. And just last week, uh, Winnipeg was chosen as the world's most intelligent community by the New York-based Intelligent Community Forum after being one of the top, uh, you know, three, one of the top seven three times in the past few years. So what is it that's happening? And I think the way the other people talk about the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, the return of the Jets to Winnipeg, uh, the redevelopment of Assiniboine Park and the creation of the Journey to Churchill and now the New Leaf, uh, the new Indigenous Gallery at the WAG. Winnipeg is home to Canada Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. Or Winnipeg's recognition as one of the cultural capitals of Canada. When I think of all those things that have really generated the sense of excitement of Winnipeg as an important destination, an important and valuable place to live, I ask them, what do these things seem to have in common? And it seems to me one is that they embrace a very bold vision for the future. And they're things that have only been made possible by the generosity of other people. And in large measure, when I look at some of those campaigns, it wouldn't have been possible without business families willing to be dream makers, not only to benefit themselves, uh, but for those around them in the communities in which they live. More importantly, in my mind, not only do those business families and family businesses provide financial support to these significant projects, 
Uh, but over the past 40 years that I've been involved in the community, I found that virtually every not-for-profit and philanthropic board that I've been involved with is heavily represented by those same business owners, their executives, and their family members. So they give not only their money, but their time and energy to build community. Just this past weekend, the Saturday edition of the Free Press had two things that stood out in my mind. Uh, one was an article on the philanthropy page uh, about Variety Club recognizing someone who had given 40 years of service to both Variety Club and to other important philanthropic initiatives in the community. He happens to be a third, a member of the third generation of a long-standing family business. Now, the other was an ad in the paper uh, recognizing the Dufresne Family Foundation for its transformative gift to the Health Sciences Center for their new uh, urology center. Both those things seem to follow a pattern that I could say I've been watching and noticing since I first got involved with United Way back in the early 1980s. And it continues through to every board that I've seen since, whether it be community building, social services, uh, arts and culture. What's equally important, and in some ways in my mind more important, is that we often hear about these things when they're big projects, significant things that are happening in the community as a whole. But in some ways, the most valuable contributions of family businesses in our community are the smaller ones uh, that are making significant impact in their own ethnic, faith-based, or local rural community. And a lot of things that don't get publicized would never have happened were it not for those businesses. It seems to be all these things kind of put together uh, seem to paint a pretty rosy picture of the role and, and the value of family businesses and something to be uh, proud of and, and, and to, uh, to take some satisfaction in. However, only 50% of new private companies get to celebrate their fifth birthday. Only one third of family businesses transition successfully from the first to second generation. And less than half of those, or only 12% of the ones that start, actually make it to the third generation. If you want to avoid the shirt sleeve to shirt sleeve in three generations, you would be one of the 3% of family businesses that actually make it to the fourth. Pretty frightening and dismal statistics, it seems to me. Now, many fail because they succumb to the competitive market forces, and that's unfortunate, but a reality of, of a very competitive business environment. And others uh, continue in business, uh, but in some form other than controlled or owned by that family entity, uh, much like happened with our business. Uh, our stores that uh, we used to own uh, are still thriving, it seems, uh, hopefully uh, still through the pandemic uh, impact, uh, but it's now been uh, some 40 years since we severed our, our family relationship with it. And so I've often been intrigued by what it is uh, that uh, are at the root of family businesses ceasing to exist as family businesses. And it seems to me that they, fail to, to survive in that form uh, because one, the owners are not able to navigate the often rough waters of transition from one generation to the next. Uh, second might be that the inheritors are unable to sustain the complex and interdependent relationships that they have as stakeholders uh, with that business. A third is that the senior generation, in my experience, often have tended to approach transition as their issue and in, in effect end up driving into the future uh, through the looking through the, the rear view mirror and, and failing to take into account the issues, priorities and, and, and challenges uh, that the next generation are facing. And in that regard, uh, I've often worried uh, that businesses often rely on advisors who may have great expertise in their field of specialty, whether it be tax, estate planning, commercial law, whatever, uh, but often tend to not understand or fully appreciate 
uh, the complex demands of intergenerational transitions, uh, particularly uh, in the current times. And the stakes have become very high uh, with, with concurrent pressures and benefits and, and, and distortions uh, over what things were like uh, 40 or 50 years ago. A number of years ago, Paul Shervish, an, ac an academic from Boston College, came to Winnipeg uh, to talk about uh, intergenerational wealth transfers that he and his group at Boston College were predicting was going to occur in the first half uh, of the 20th, 21st century. Uh, and he had identified with his group that there would be a, a $40 trillion transition of wealth moving from one generation to the next over a 40 to 50 year period in the United States. Using Canada as, as basically using the, the, being a tenth, a tenth the size, uh, if there was a, a $40 trillion wealth transfer coming in the States, that would translate to about $4 trillion in Canada. And much of that was in family businesses. Now, when I first heard him speak, and he was looking at, at it from the perspective of how that might impact philanthropy, uh, I had my, a lot of difficulty getting my head around what, what does a trillion mean and what does it look like? And someone told me that it would be easier to understand if we translated that into time. In that regard, a million, a million seconds takes 11 and a half days. A billion seconds takes 31 and a half years. But a trillion takes 317 centuries. So although some of us can understand millions, a billion is a little bit of a stretch and a trillion is just beyond. A couple of years ago, I came across an article in the philanthropic journal, the philanthropist journal rather, uh, that confirmed for me that what Shervis was predicting 20 years ago was in fact pretty bang on. And in that article in The Philanthropist, it said that Canadians will inherit 780 billion during the next decade. That's the decade we're in now. And coupled with the data that approximately 80% in its article said that of Canadian businesses are family owned, it implied in its mind, a real opportunity for increased philanthropy uh, as families and, and those who control family wealth uh, were increasingly oriented towards leaving uh, more than just memories uh, and money to their children and grandchildren, uh, but wanting to do something for their community as well. There's no doubt that that wealth transfer has also been uh, one of the factors that has led to an escalation and a rapid increase of private foundations. And for people whose wealth isn't sufficient to have their own private foundation, uh, to the rapid increase in donor advised funds uh, through a, a variety of vehicles. What's really interesting in my mind though, is going beyond just this increased private control of wealth and decision-making uh, that will be in the hands of private parties, uh, but also uh, the role that the next generation potentially of younger entrepreneurs, their families and their children uh, can have in shaping the future. Uh, this past weekend uh, in his opening uh, talk at the uh, COP26 conference on the environment, uh, Prince Charles argued uh, that the solution to some of the challenges facing global society will only be met with the active engagement of people in the international business community, as well as governments. In a domestic uh, sense, uh, I've been reading of late more and more frequently uh, that seemingly intractable problems of the past, whether it be homelessness, uh, in inequality, systemic racism, are now being addressed in some creative ways by partnerships being formed largely by business families and members of the third sector, the service providers. Where that will lead, I don't know, but it's an exciting new way of seeing that, that 
combination of skills, talents, and experiences uh, addressing problems uh, in ways that were formally seen as not possible and therefore not successful. So I believe that, that there is a value to these family businesses and to their continuation as family businesses, both for community uh, and for the economy. So what are the challenges? Why aren't more successfully transitioned from one generation to the next? And there's really a couple of categories that I believe are the key. Uh, one of them, ironically, uh, is demographic related. And it's really what I call the longevity problem. Before World War II, back in the middle of the last century, transitions were pretty simple, primarily because there was little, if any, generational overlap. In 1911, when my late father was born, his life expectancy at birth was 51 years. Yeah? He did a lot better than that and lived to be in uh, to his late 70s. But even when I was born in 1944, at birth, my life expectancy was 64. I'm happy to report that I'm now 13 years past my life expectancy and recently was told that statistically I can expect to live another 10 or more years. In 1969, when our first child was born, life expectancy had increased to 80 years. So within two generations, we went from 50 to 64 to 80. I remember when I was younger, uh, the standard line in the 1960s was people saying, how long will I live after I retire? Today, I hear the same thing. A lot of people saying, how long will I live after I retire? The difference being that in the 1960s, people retiring were concerned that they wouldn't live long enough to really enjoy the fruits of their labor. Today, people are worried, my gosh, what happens if I live long enough, I might run out of resources before I run out of time. In family businesses, though, the critical issue is that transitions no longer mean replacing one generation with the next, but really, in my experience, it requires a development of a mindset that talks about how do we have multi-generational relationships coexisting at the same time, where the founder parent is still around, but may no longer be the CEO and in charge, or where the CEO may not even be a member of the family depending on the ages and experience of the next generation, where people increasingly have to recognize that their children are not equal in terms of either talents, needs, experience, or interests. And so these things combined seem to require a need to address the separation of roles in a much more formalized manner than our parents' generation or grandparents' generation ever thought of. Initially, as I say, that one of the examples would be you can't transition someone into power without at the same time or in advance of that having a plan to transition someone out of power. Ironically, CEOs of public companies historically and to this day report that they're looking forward to their retirement and to other opportunities. At the same time, CEOs of private companies are reluctant to retire. And most seem to believe that succession planning should wait till after their funeral. It seems to me that frequently they model themselves after uh, the Windsor Corporation, uh, one of the world's richest and most enduring family businesses uh, that's been around for centuries. Uh, whose current CEO uh, is named Elizabeth uh, and became CEO for life uh, 69 years ago. Many admire her, uh, including me, for being 95 and, and still uh, performing so well on the throne. But I can't help but wonder what it must have been like uh, to be Charles. Charles was designated the heir apparent for the CEO position 69 years ago and he's still waiting for his chance to move into the corner office. So in, in addition to those issues of, of just overlapping generations and, and being around to watch your, your, your family grow in multiple generations, 
Uh, we also have a, a, a series of other factors uh, that I'm not capable of speaking about with any authority, uh, but that we have to keep in mind. And that has to do with things like the prevalence of divorce, which when I was growing up back in the 50s uh, was pretty rare. Uh, and concurrent with that is now the notion of blended families. We now see fewer and fewer children and people who are having children having them later in life. We see different views of work-life balances, what's important to different people and their families. We see the rise of women in professions and in the workplace. So there's all these factors that I think come into play within business families in ways that are much more profound uh, and, and, and have much greater and different impact uh, than in public or uh, non-family settings. As well though, there's a series of, of dynamic external forces that I think are really challenging uh, and particularly uh, challenging to, to family businesses. You know, today isn't at all what many of us so confidently knew it would be sure to look like uh, just a few years ago. Technology, social media, globalization have all had significant impacts on how communities and, 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 and uh, are facing the world of today. In that regard, uh, it seems to me that, that uh, we're faced with, with all of the technological, geopolitical issues. Uh, and Warren Bennis, uh, founding chair of the Institute at the University of California, said that the success in the future will require leaders to recognize the organizational ecology and understand the context of organizational life in this visual, virtual, digital world. Uh, some of us still struggle, struggle, although we're thankful for technology. It allows us to get together on a day like today when we can't be in person. Uh, but we have all of those changes. And at the same time as we're struggling, some of my generation, to keep up with those na the nature of those changes, we're now also faced with a variety of other issues. The Me Too movement, LGBT rights, Black Lives Matter, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, recognition of the horrors of residential schools and, and the obligation we have as a society to address it in a meaningful way. The current and, and no longer looming but happening environmental crisis and what does it mean for the kinds of adjustments we're going to have to make. And the impact that we've seen of COVID so that we now know that we can't assume anything is going to be as we thought it would be for tomorrow. And that has, I think, some really interesting, complex challenges for the next generation of leadership. Someone expressed it by saying that the leaders of tomorrow in businesses, whether they're family owned or public and leaders of all organizations have to become adept in recognizing the increased volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity of life in the 21st century. We're gonna to need to admit, find ways that everyone becomes more adept at addressing matters of social justice and equity, climate change and the environment and all the other issues inherent in ESG. <clears throat> so how does a family business go about addressing all of these complex issues? 50 years ago, when I first became focused on some of this, uh, things were simpler and, and people became oriented towards addressing them as basically tax issues. The problem with that was that the benefits of the, that estate planning get buried with the person who they benefited and the problems remain to be sorted out by the next generation. So fundamentally, it seems to me, the answer is that any effective transition plan has to include three fundamental components. How do you deal with the change in ownership? How do you address the issue of who's going to be involved in management and employment within the company? And what systems are going to be put in place for the governance of the family as well as the business? And this becomes much more complex. We have to remember 
that when we started with a family business, most of them started by having a single person as the entrepreneur who owned the business. The board, if there was such a thing, tended to include the owner. Back in the days that it applied to me in the 50s, uh, the owner was basically male. And the board, if there was such a thing, really included the owner and the owner's partner. The couple ran the company. It tended to be run as a somewhat autocratic, benevolent dictatorship. And the children, uh, by and large, were raised to be thinking that they did what they were told. If that business did survive and get passed from one generation to the next, basically it went from being a proprietorship to being a partnership of siblings who carry with them lots of baggage. We see that in some of the conflicts that erupt 50 years later when they decide they can no longer get along. But there is something about the dynamic of sharing burdens as well as opportunities with someone that you grew up with and sat around the same dinner table with every day. To go into the third generation, you leave this notion of being a partnership to be being involved in a structure that becomes in effect a shareholder group because you now have cousins who may have quite different relationships with different parts of the family who increasingly may be raised in not only in different homes but in different communities. So that there's this notion that requires people to sort these things out in more formalized ways. Each of those three things, the ownership issues, the employment issues and the governance issues raise critical issues that have to be identified and addressed, albeit differently in different families. So every family is unique, but every family business has to address those same sets of issues. And it seems to me that the key becomes increasingly reliance, increased reliance on advisors to help navigate these various issues. Starting premise I have is that every family business will experience those transitions on a regular basis, like it or not. It'll either happen by plan or by death. But one way or another, the current structure can't last forever. So the role of the advisor, as I see it, is fundamentally helping to determine what if any transition is most appropriate at any given point in time for that family and that business. The key is helping people make, take the right action at the right time in the right sequence to achieve a shared desired outcome. Transitions are complex processes, not single events. They all are unique and all have to be addressed as such. Not only are they unique, but because they're processes, they require time. Most fail when they allow insufficient time for the process to unfold in an orderly way. As an advisor, one of the things that you have to remember is coming into this. Uh, you're coming into this transition uh, in the middle of act two, so to speak. There's lots that's already happened, uh, lots that's happening uh, and much that you don't know. So one of the key lessons for an advisor is being mindful, as Rumsfeld used to say, uh, be mindful of the things you don't know, you don't know. The things you know you don't know, you can address easily, but be mindful of the others because most family businesses are somewhat like icebergs. 90% of the danger can't be seen because it's underwater, but that's what sinks both ships and family transition plans. In that regard, as families grow, it becomes increasingly important for an advisor to make sure that she or he understands the perspective that all stakeholders have. You can't rely just on the input and the assessment of the situation, the opportunities and the challenges from the most senior member of the family. Uh, in that regard, uh, it seems to me that successful transition plans uh, require advisors to see their role as being much more of the tailor than of the retail salesperson. A successful transition really is the result 
of a custom-made solution. So although it's often tempting to try and sell something off the rack that works somewhere else for someone else, uh, be careful because oftentimes garments off the rack may look good, but may not wear well over the long haul. I recently was reminded that uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, we used to think of challenges as, as being like puzzles. And the key was making sure you had all the pieces and fitting them together in the right way and the picture would become clear. The starting premise though, was that there was a, a right way and a singular right way to make put the puzzle together and get the right outcome. As I get older and we move into this century, I keep thinking that puzzles are out, Lego is in. So my advice to uh, anyone in the advice providing field, learn to use Lego. The key to Lego is that the right answer still requires putting all the pieces together and having them all included in the outcome, but recognizing that the final structure, if it has all the pieces in it, can be put together in a variety of ways. And those different ways may be different at different points in time. So it's a matter of not only recognizing that there is no singular right answer, but that any right answer may be right for a moment in time, but only for a period of time. In that regard, it seems to me that uh, the key becomes recognizing what are the characteristics for a good family business transition plan. And I think if you keep those characteristics in mind, we'll all be much more successful in what we help people develop. Uh, the first is that it has to be seen as fair. Fair in the eyes of all the stakeholders. A critical piece of that in my mind is having a process that people can agree to as being fair re before and regardless of what the actual outcome will be. My experience has been that families stay together when they believe that the process to reach conclusions, particularly as the family becomes larger uh, and respects the values of the family, are more important in keeping families together than what the actual outcome is. Second, a good outcome has to be strategic. It has to tie into aspirational objectives of the next generation. So although values don't change, goals, objectives, and aspirations do. And these days we're finding different generations have quite different expectations and outlooks for the future. They must be heard and considered, even if they're not accepted in the end. A good plan has to be comprehensive and complete. It has to be seen as providing the best answers to the challenges as based on the evidence, the information and the knowledge that we have today. And so in that regard, uh, it's dangerous to say, well, we'll get to that another time. Even though there may not be full answers available for every issue, they have to be addressed thoughtful in a thoughtful manner that includes input from all stakeholders. Finally, uh, any good plan has to be one that can be implemented or else it just becomes another report on the shelf. But not only does it have to be implementable, it has to be feasible and it has to be something that's adaptable because if we've learned anything over the last couple of years, is that things change and can change very quickly. None of us would have ever conceived two years ago that we would spend the bulk of the following couple of years uh, in relative confinement, that we'd be interacting with each other through technology rather than in person. So plans have to include the, the ability to change, to adapt, to modify over time. The direction may stay the same, the, the end goal may stay the same, but somewhat like trying to sail in windy conditions, it may require some tacking because the best way to get from point A to point B uh, is often not a straight line.
So I think in that regard, people providing advice to founders, regardless of what their professional background is, is that it's quite different dealing with the complexities of transition than it is in providing specific advice in a transactional setting. A couple of years ago, David Meister and his colleagues developed and wrote a book called The Trusted Advisor. And it seems to me that some of the things in that book resonate when I think about the kinds of needs and demands for advisors in these very delicate, difficult, dangerous sorts of, of settings of family business transitions. And they talked about that, that trust is not something that's particular to any profession, any calling, any uh, job, but really is something that attracts and, and is attributable to individuals. And they developed a formula uh, which talked about trustworthiness. And they call it this trust formula that they developed says that basically there are four components. A couple of which are obvious and, and, and not surprising uh, and, and really apply quite generally. Their credibility and reliability. Credibility is someone has to be seen as having the subject matter expertise uh, that, that's required in that setting. Uh, and reliability refers to their actions. It has to be someone who's got a track record and can convince the client uh, that they're able and willing and will deliver or what they say they will. So one talks about uh, you know, what they know and the other talks about what they do. But the third element that they refer to in building trust and becoming a trusted advisor is the capacity to share intimate information. And they call this the intimacy factor, creating an environment where individuals as well as the group will be comfortable talking about things that their fears, their aspirations, their concerns. Because if you don't get that information, how can you provide guidance and assistance to the real challenge of the day? So if those three things are what they call the numerator, they all tend to increase trust. And the one factor that they also add that's the denominator that has the impact of decreasing that trustworthiness is the perception that the advisor has her or his own vested interests as the primary objective rather than the needs, the interests, and the, the objectives of the client. And so they talk about this in, as, as developing almost a mathematical form, formula. Uh, I'm skeptical about formulas. Uh, but I think that in principle, that notion of the trustworthiness factor is critical because I believe, and from what I can see in, in the marketplace, that families based facing these transitions are increasingly are going to be looking for, for people who provide that trustworthiness factor to all the stakeholders. And it's tricky to do sometimes when you're dealing with two or even three generations at the same time. I recently received a book uh, from a young acquaintance written by Jim Blanchard called Thinking Big, A History of the Winnipeg Business Community, back from the fur trading days to the Second World War. And unfortunately, it, it's a fascinating book about Winnipeg's history and about how we got to where we were, at least then, uh, which was the beginning of my time. Uh, but unfortunately, the book ends uh, in the middle of the last century. And I often wish there was a sequel that went from the Second World War through to the end of the last century, uh, which would cover the time that I and my contemporaries were in business. And I have no doubt that someday the content that might be providing the wherewithal for the third edition will be written based on the decisions that are made by business families and family businesses in Winnipeg, beginning in the 21st century. So what does that mean? I think when it comes to transitions, that the role of a trusted advisor, whether as a consultant or an independent director of a company, is ultimately about helping businesses navigate these complex and challenging processes. 
Success requires that transition plans respect families' core values, identify and mitigate identifiable risks, and thereby increase the likelihood that both the family and his business will be able to realize their objectives for the future together rather than having to pursue them separately. So even though I start off by saying that only 12% of family businesses get passed on to the third generation, we know from the metrics that are available that their contribution is disproportionate in terms of creating impact both on economic growth and building civil society. Imagine for a moment how much greater that impact would be if the success rate into the third generation for family transitions was 15% instead of 12%. 3% doesn't sound like very much of an increase over that historical average. But in real terms, that would be a 25% increase. In my mind, that's a quantum leap. And that quantum leap forward can't be relied upon to occur only by the mega companies, even if they're family controlled, carrying the full load. Because as I said before, they represent only two tenths of 1% of family businesses. So it will require not only the survival, but the flourishing of many more of those small and medium sized family businesses into the next generation, so that some of them may become the mega companies of tomorrow. So I'd encourage anyone in the business of advising or participating in a family business uh, to think of how they can make their own incremental contribution. And I'm reminded of Robert Kennedy's famous challenge when he said, few of us have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. For the sake of our children and grandchildren, I hope that people who are providing advice to business families and family businesses are up to that challenge. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Harvey. Uh, much appreciated. I very much enjoyed the, uh, the talk. Um, and so now I'll turn it over to uh, Professor McPherson and, uh, to say kind of you know, some thank yous and acknowledgements. So Professor McPherson, please take it away. Thanks so much, Bruce. Really appreciate that. Listen, first of all, thank you to everybody for showing up. We know that it's, it's, it can often be very difficult to hold uh, lectures and events like these on Zoom. Um, so we're very appreciative that everybody made the time to, to be here today uh, and to listen to what I thought was a great presentation. Um, internally, there's a lot of people to thank here, here at the law school. Um, the Days Hotel Committee, uh, Lily Deerdorf and Christine Mazur, who did all the technical and uh, logistical stuff for us. Uh, and the of course, we can't forget the SEMPs because without their generous donation and showing a way that, that you can contribute to your community, um, we wouldn't be able to do things like this and other donors like that. And one of the donors, and he doesn't make a big deal out of this, is Harvey himself and, and their families. Let's notice that the, the family members of both of the gentlemen who were uh, listed as the people who were either supporting the lecture, Rod Semt and uh, Harvey Sector, both their family members made their way to us uh, to be here for this lecture today. And that shows, I think, the type of family cohesion that Harvey was talking about um, long after the, uh, the direct business stuff was over, at least for Harvey. Um, but we really appreciate people making the, their way to do this. I've known Harvey for almost 20 years now. Uh, Harvey talks a lot about decision making. His hiring of me probably wasn't his best decision, but one I certainly appreciate. Uh, so a great uh, thank you to them. And thank you to everybody who's contributed so much uh, to this. And hopefully we can get Harvey back to talk about those other things that he said he didn't have time to talk about today, uh, because it sounds like there's a lot more to be said on these types of topics. And hopefully the Days Hotel Center will be able to support that uh, going forward. But thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it to, to Jeannie and Rod and to, to the, uh, the Sector family. Really appreciate all that. And we'll talk soon. Um, but what a great uh, lecture and thank you so much, Harvey.